Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ave Maria Divine Will. This is uh, today's introduction uh, to the Divine Will. Today's meeting is uh, entitled The Three Fiats. The work is go of God is going to be delivered to us, humankind, in three fiats. The work of creation, the work of redemption, and the work of sanctification. Let's go ahead and start this meeting by praying to our Father in Latin. Pater Noster, quies in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniam regnum tuum, fia voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum, tabernovis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicur et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentacion, Set libera nos amalo. Amen. I'm sorry, I didn't start in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gracia plena. Teco, benedicta tu e moliergos, et benedictus fructus ventris tu e Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus. No get in hora mortis nostra. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritus Santo. Decuteran in principio, et no get temper, per secula seculorum. Amen. All right. So in this talk, we're going to talk about the three works of God. The work of creation by God the Father. The work of redemption by God the Son, and the work of sanctification by God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to start this study by looking at some of the sources in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're also going to look at the Book of Heaven, the writings of the Servant of God, Luisa Picoretta. And we're also going to review the, uh, the timeline of creation based on the book, The Symphony of Creation by Father Pablo Martin Sanguiao. So who is the servant of God, Luisa Picoretta? The servant of God, Luisa Picoretta, is known as the little daughter of my divine will, of the divine will, the little secretary of my will, and the little secretary of the story of creation. And these are some of the titles that our Lord Jesus Christ gave her in her diary that she recorded over some period of time. And Luisa a little history, a little bio on Luisa. Uh, she was born in Corrado, Italy, on April 23rd, 1865. That was 158 years ago. And at the age of nine, she started hearing the voice of Jesus in her interior. She has a tremendous life. At the age of nine, just imagine when you were nine years old. All of a sudden, starting to hear the, the, the voice of our Lord inside of yourself. She, all her life was just amazing. By the age of 23, she had her first mystical marriage with Jesus. And you'll see if you look at all the saints uh, of the Catholic Church throughout time, you know, maybe they'll have one mystical marriage with their Lord, and that's about it. That's all they need to achieve that high level of sanctity, right, and union with our Lord. So, but Luisa, no, Luisa went farther than that. He, uh, in a mythic marriage, you basically become uh, a spouse of the Lord, right? So at the age of 24, the, the next year, she had a second mythical marriage uh, with Jesus. And in this mythical marriage, she received a new gift, a gift called the gift of living in the divine will. So she had a first mythical marriage. That was the marriage here on earth. And we read about these in the writings. They describe in much detail. And the second one she received in heaven, um, where she actually um, received this gift, the gift of living in the divine will. And we'll see some about that, what, what the gift is all about. So at the age of 34, Luisa had a third mystical marriage, and this time it was the marriage of the cross. And she received the uh, crucifixion. Um, much like uh, many other um, 
saints in history like St. Francis, Padre Pio received the marriage of the cross as well. And at the age of 35, she received a fourth mystical marriage. So four marriages, so four mystical marriages and all. That com this last marriage com confirmed her in the full possession of the gift of living in the divine world. That was full possession, meaning that she received it you know, from this at the age of 24. And she possessed it at the age of 35. She fully understood what the gift was all about. Um, let's see what comes next. So from the age of 22, right? The servant of God, Luisa Picoretta. So she was confined to her bed as a victim soul. Um, on a daily basis, a Catholic priest or confessor would come by her bedside to bless her and bring her back to life. So every single night from the age of 22, imagine this, she would suffer tremendous pains, right? She would be left in this state that uh, it was came to be known as uh, um, uh, petrified. Uh, she was petrified, right? She was petrified. That meant that she uh, remained um, almost, it, it was like a death, right? So she would remain on her bed, she lie in her bed, she was not conscious, and she would be uh, petrified, meaning that nobody could move her. Actually, the same state that a person, when they die, they, they get the rigor mortis. You cannot bend her arms or her fingers or anything. She would just uh, like frozen, right? But they, they had an additional thing that nobody could lift her up from her bed. You know, initially they didn't realize what this was. You know, nobody could lift her up. She was so heavy. And that was the work of our Lord doing this miracle to prevent her from being taken away, from being moved away. And this happened to her from the age of 22. She would remain on her deathbed, basically, on a daily basis. She would suffer tremendous pains before going into this state. Uh, so what we've learned is that it, when the soul separates from the body like a death, there's a certain amount of pain, right? For Luisa, it was tremendous pain. To separate the soul from the body takes a great amount of pain, right? So that's what Luisa would suffer every night. And um, so at the very beginning, when this started happening to her, it was very confusing, right? Because they didn't know how to wake her up, how to bring her back to life. Uh, it just so happened that uh, the first few times that this happened, there was a fry, uh, uh, a fraile, right? And he came over and he blessed her in the hand. And the minute he did that, he came back to life. So from that point on, uh, she required uh, the assistance of a priest, a Catholic priest that would come by her bedside every morning to wake her up. And this was our Lord's way of making her known, making her a child of the church. That's how Archbishop from Trani refers to her. She is a child of the church. The church had to take care of her every single day for the remaining of her life. And we're talking about here, she was born in uh, 1865. So uh, 65, 75, 85, and 80, 87. From 1887, she had to be taken care of by a prince of church. She, she, she died at her young age of 81 years old, right? So she had, you know, 60 years, almost 60 years of suffering on her deathbed, right? And uh, having this experience of being petrified. So that is something that no other saint has had to go through. And this is the way that our Lord ensured that the Catholic Church will look over her, look over her writings, you know, and realize that, okay, this is not something, somebody that appeared overnight and, uh, you know, had this sort of thing. So, yeah, right here it says, every night until her death, she would enter into this state of petrification, known as her usual state, and it's, uh, it was as if she was dead. So every morning you could say that she resurrected, right? Because the, the priest would come and bless her in the hand. The confessor would come celebrate the mass in her bedroom. So this is one of the few, she was a lay person, so that's a, a Dominican tertiary, but uh, the Pope allowed her to have mass in her bedroom so she could stay at home, stay in her bed, be in the victim soul she was, you know, and our Lord gave her the permission through a very, that was another miracle, to have the Pope sign the okay to have a priest come and celebrate her mass in her bedroom for her to receive communion. Because that's the one thing that, she, if there was ever something that she wanted was to receive communion on a daily basis, right? So that com confessor would come, celebrate mass in the bedroom and read her diary from the night before. 
And Luisa basically survived on the Eucharist alone. She didn't eat anything, almost anything. So under the obedience of her spiritual director, she would have to eat something every day. So what they did is they brought her some grapes, you know, like on a daily basis. The, the families from Corrado, where she lived, they yeah, they used to fight amongst one another to be the ones sending her something to, to eat, something like a dish, right? And the dish would arrive at the house and she would be given like the grapes or something very little like that. And then the, as the, after she ate the grapes, after some time, the grapes would actually come out. But they would come out uh, more pure, smelling beautiful. And, and sometimes they were given back to the family that had sent the, the, the lunch or the dinner. That's how you know, people would fight to receive the grapes that had been consumed, but they came out pristine. They were returned in a pristine way, and people thought that they, they would, uh, they would uh, heal them. From whatever they had so i'm sure we had a luisa here in alan maria you know, we would do the same right we'd fight to see who, who gets the grapes <laughs> uh, okay so anyway so uh luisa wrote over almost 40 years uh she wrote the uh her diary by obedience to her confessor right she wrote 36 notebooks known as the book of heaven where she wrote down everything that Jesus told her, especially as it concerns the gift of living in the divine world. So what happened with Luisa is she had only gone to first grade. She only had a first grade education. You know, she uh, really, they didn't really have, you know, the school system we have nowadays. She came from a very poor uh, farmer's uh, family. Uh, the, uh, the father, he would take care of a farm. And so they didn't really have any... Um, any education at that point in time, right? So she also, in addition to the to her diary, she also wrote the Hours of the Passion. And this was based on uh, her confessor at the time, Father Hannibal Maria de Francia, that in um, 2004, 2005, he, he was beatified. And he's Saint Hannibal Maria de Francia. So he was her confessor. And it was through the guidance, uh, through the uh, obedience to, to the, to St. Hannibal, that she wrote The Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, which is a book that talks about the last 24 hours of our Lord's uh, life here on earth, you know, the whole um, passion. And then she also wrote the book of Our Lady, uh, The Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. And then she wrote some letters and some other things, right? But uh, like the Christmas Novena was a big thing uh, when, first, when she first started, you know, her life. Um, at, at 16 years old or so. So she wrote this uh, over a period of 40 years. And uh, the thing with Luisa is that she really wanted to remain hidden. She didn't want to, she's not like the uh, uh, mystics or missionaries nowadays. They want to go out into YouTube and, and be the, the one with the most likes, right? She wanted to remain hidden all her life. She didn't want to write. It was obedience that, you know, forced her to write. And, um, you know, she didn't want to reveal any of, any of her intimacy. She was a spouse of Christ. You know, she wanted to remain everything between the two of them. And so um, in 1947, at the age of uh, 81, Luisa died. She died after 15 days of having a, a pneumonia, right? And uh, you can see her. People would come here. She was, she was um, exposed for four days. She was, uh, she was available. The whole town would come over and see her. She looked like she appeared as she was sleeping. And the thing about her is like, uh, you know, one of the miracles of Christ, right, is to make sure that everybody knew that this was his, his spouse, right? And she would come and she didn't suffer rigor mortis. So they would come over. They would be able to bend her arm and, and flex her fingers. She didn't, what she experienced every night of her life, and that's how they told that she was dead, it was because this time was different. Right, this time she was not, she didn't have, fall into the rigor mortis. Uh, she wasn't heavy, she would be picked up, you know, and she was flexible, you know. So she died, you know, that was her, her four years. And people would come over, the whole town would come over and see her, you know, give her a, um, you know, even her, her casket, you know, was, was, was specially made for her. She was a, a, a short person, right? So she, she had this casket that was created. Almost, uh, she was given a funeral procession fit for a queen. So this was uh, the whole town came out, you know, to celebrate uh, the entrance into heaven of 
uh, Luisa Picarreta, the little daughter of the divine will. So she was considered a saint at that point. Uh, this was back in yeah, uh, 1947, on um, March the 4th. And so this is her today. This is her, her tomb in uh, the church of Santa Maria Greca. She was moved. She was originally interred uh, in a mausoleum of one of the priests that took care of Lisa, uh, the family of, of this priest. And later on, um, not exactly sure of the date, I don't remember now, but in 2019, she was moved. Her remains were in the back of the church in Corato, Santa Maria Greca. She was moved to a special room on the side of the altar, you know, in the church. So she has a little uh, place of rest there now. So we bring this up because, you know, as we go through talk, we'll talk about her her, her uh, writings uh, well, and, and some of that. Um, but anyway, going on over into the, uh, entering now into the talk, right? So this, work, this, this talk is really about the three fiats of God, the timeline of the work of God, uh, spanning all the way from creation to redemption to sanctification, right? And we're going to base uh, a little bit of the timeline on this book uh, by Father Pablo Martin, who has known the divine will for uh, 50 years, right? He's one of the originals. And uh, as you can see from the bottom, you have the, uh, that's where creation, the beginning of time. And I'll, I'll show you more, more of these charts uh, this is the work of the Holy Trinity. This is the whole work will be uh, filled out. You see first, there's a first age of humanity. That's the beginning of time. It starts with Adam and Eve, you know, in paradise. Then it goes into a second age of humanity, little by little, we, until we get the fullness of time. Fullness of time is really redemption with Jesus and Mary. Then there's the, that time that is referred to as the third age of humanity. So we're going now from the Old Testament into the New Testament, the era, the, the two eras of the first, at the beginning of the Old Testament, first age and second age of humanity, and then the third age of humanity now with our Lord, uh, you know, giving us this New Testament. Uh, and then, you know, after this, if you think about these as the six days of creation, we have the seventh day when our Heavenly Father rested. Um, well, yeah, if you guys, if you guys uh, can't hear me, uh, you know, like, you guys are welcome to either join over a little bit, you know, or come over here closer because it's, it's going to be a long talk. So it'll, it'll hurt my voice. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if it's really hard to hear, let me know. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So it over a little bit over here and, and uh yeah feel free to move your chair over you know because once the music uh for those of you on the zoom we have a a party going on outside uh in a party of the maria uh social club you know so it'll get harder to hear so it's better if you guys move up you know let's see everybody on the on the first line right here it'll be probably be easier to hear right there you go. Yeah. This, is, this feels more familiar, right? Like the, the family. There you go. Sorry about you guys on the Zoom. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. All right. Okay. So going into the seventh day of creation, the day of rest of our Lord, and it's, this is probably where our interest lies the most, right? Which is the millennium known as the uh, the kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. All right. So we'll get to that part. The second part of this talk will concentrate mostly on this part, you know, going over the actual timeline of creation. Uh, this, the first part, you know, we'll just uh, look at some of the works in the Old Testament, the New Testament. You know, works of Luisa referring to creation. It's good to understand what creation was all about in the beginning. So let's start in the beginning, right? That creation is the work of God the Father, you know, that is expressed in a fiat lux. 
And from Genesis 1-1, we see that uh, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And this let there be light, it's actually in Latin, it's referred to as the fiat lux. Let there be light. When our Lord pronounced the verb, pronounced fiat lux, all the, the, the whole world came into creation, right? We know uh, it, it, we go through all the different parts of creation, but that was the beginning. That was the first fiat, you know, expressed by the Holy Trinity in the, in the words of in the work of God the Father. And from the servant of God, Luisa Picoretta now, we're going to volume 12, in which our Lord tells Luisa about the fiat lux. And he says, my daughter, it is my usual way after I have spoken to remain silent. I want to rest in my own word, that is in my own work, come out of me. And I did this in the creation. After I said fiat lux, let there be light, and light came to be, Fiat to all other things, and things came out to life, I wanted to rest. My eternal light rested in the light that was issued in time. My love, my love rested in the love with which I invested all of creation. My beauty, my beauty rested in the whole universe, which I tempered with my own beauty. My wisdom and power also rested in which I ordered everything with such wisdom and power that I myself in looking said, how beautiful is the work come out of me. I want to rest in it, right? So this is our Lord telling us about that fiat look in this fiat of creation, the eternal light, the love, the beauty, his wisdom and power had, had come out of him, right? And now he was at the point that he wanted to rest. And that's the seventh day of creation, the seventh day where we rest, right? And so going to the very uh, beginning, you know, and we've all heard uh, the, about the story of creation of man, right? We know that in the beginning, God created heaven, earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the waters, the plants, and all the animals. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Genesis 1, right? Male and female, he created them. And so let's go over to Luisa's writings. And from volume 31, let's learn, you know, what our Lord had to say about the creation of man. Listen to this very closely. Uh, Jesus says, my daughter, what a sweet memory, the creation of man. He was created in an ecstasy of love of ours. He was created, man was created in an ecstasy of love of the Holy Trinity. Our love was so great that we, the Holy Trinity, remained enraptured before our own work that we were issuing to the light. Man and God, God being enraptured, creating Adam. Isn't that incredible, right? The beauty with which we had invested him enraptured us. The sanctity that with which we had filled him enraptured us. The shape, the harmony with which we had formed him enraptured us. His prerogative, each of his qualities were an ecstasy of love that we felt, we the Holy Trinity felt, and that enraptured us to love him. So our love remained shaken, subdued, and putting us into ecstasy it made the operating and everlasting love toward man arise within us. Just listen to that. You know, how much love? Have, when have we ever heard, like in the Bible, when our Lord repeated his words twice? He really wanted to make a point. Look what he's saying here. Enraptured us, enraptured us, enraptured us, enraptured us. That his creation, Adam, enraptured God in a way that it just, he repeated four times. It was in an ecstasy of love that God created man. God created man in his image and likeness, right? He created a little God. He created like the most fantastic piece that he could create after creating the whole universe. And we looked at the universe we have out there today, right? It's incredible. But he created the whole universe. And of all the universe, the one thing that enraptured God was the creation of man. 
that is just something else, right? So um, that tells us something about the creation of man. That tells us something about the state of origin. He created us in this at this level, right? And this is very important. This I want you guys to keep this in mind as we go through this talk. This is the, the state of origin is important because after the fall, God wants to reestablish the state of origin. Right now, could we say we're in the same state of origin as he created us? No, we're in the fallen state, right? So he wants to recreate his creature to the same state that he created us in the beginning. Let me just put the other one just uh, to reduce the noise outside, right? Okay, so yes, God wants to reestablish the state of his creation in man. And the way he's going to do it is through the era of sanctification, right? So imagine, you know, God creating this beautiful statue, his work of creation, his reflection of himself. Imagine God, you know, when, when we see our Lord being transfigured, right? He was shining his divinity. That's almost like the state man was back then in paradise. He was living in paradise. He was given everything, right? It was this beautiful creation. And then, as we all know, man falls. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden for his disobedience, right? So men fell from living in the divine will man has the gift of living in the divine will you know man and god walked paradise walked over the earth you know every day in paradise and was beautiful it was wonderful and all of a sudden now man is you know goes to the to the exile adam goes to the exile and we see the falling of man from that point on let's now see what uh, from the book of heaven from volume 14 February 26, 1922. What our Lord tells Louisa about the fall of man, right? Jesus says, my daughter, I created the creature beautiful, noble, with eternal and divine origin, full of happiness and worthy of me. Sin ruined him from top to bottom. Sin ruined us. It disennobled him. It deformed him and rendered him the most unhappy creature, unable to grow, because sin stopped his growth and covered him with wounds. That's just to be repugnant to the mere sight. Goodness. We are repugnant to the sight of God. Right? That's what it's saying. Right? To, to bring this down a little closer to us. What animal is the most repugnant animal you can think of? Right? Hmm? Like, you guys got to speak up because pigs. Big snake. I'm gonna say the cockroach. Whenever I see a cockroach, I just feel like taking my shoe off. Right? That's if we that's the way God feels about us when he sees us. He's saying the most repugnant to the mere sight. The way we feel about a cockroach is the way God feels about us, his creation, the beautiful statue he created was so beautiful he was enraptured and all of a sudden we become a cr from now i'm not going to call the cockroach a cr because i don't want to you know ruin your dinner tonight right crs that's what we became after sin and that, i think that's the realization that this was not the state of origin this is not what god wanted for us in the beginning right so after the fall, God, God wants to reestablish us to that state of origin. So how is he going to do it? Right? We'll see. Let's see what else Jesus had to say. Uh, from volume 23, February 5th, 1928. Jesus says, my daughter, as Adam sinned, God made him the promise of the future redeemer. Centuries passed, but the promise did not fail. And the generations have the good of redemption, right? So we go from creation, from having a beautiful, you know, divine being that was the reflection of God uh, to a CR. And now God has to give us his own son to fulfill redemption. So now we will walk into the uh, timeline of the work of God, the era of redemption. 
which comes out to be the fullness of time. So if you look there in the center of the chart, we have redemption that starts with Jesus and Mary. We go from the Old Testament, from the two eras of the Old Testament, into now the new era of the New Testament, right? With the fullness of time being the, the, the work of Christ, the work of redemption. And we, so we basically see, and I'll try to explain as we go through here, you know, in the first stage of humanity, we have Adam and Eve all the way here. That's 2,000 years to Noah. That is the, the, the end of the first era without 2,000 years. Then we go into Abraham and Sarah. Uh, that's the beginning of, of the second age of humanity, right? It runs all the way through to the fullness of times so where now we have Mary, Our Lady, you know, saying her fiat. Uh, the, re the era of redemption, uh, the work of God the Son starts with Our Lady's fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, which is Latin for uh, let it be done to me according to thy word. From Luke 138, Mary said on the Annunciation, the first fiat of redemption, Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. So, Thank you, Jesus. This is the beginning of that fiat of redemption with Our Lady that we're going to celebrate next weekend, right? Uh, you know, on the 25th of March. And uh, let's see what our Lord tells Luisa on the Book of Heaven, Volume 19, June 15, 1928, about the fiat of Our Lady. And Jesus says, this happened also to my celestial mama. When she was told, I hail you, Mary, full of grace, you will conceive the Son of God. And on hearing this, she was frightened. She trembled and said, how can this happen? But she ended up saying, Tia mihi secundum verbum tuum, which is let it be done unto me according to your word. Okay. So the other fiat, the fiat of our Lord, the night before our Lord was crucified, he was in the garden of Gethsemane and this angel Brought him this cup, you can see right here in the picture, right? The angel coming down from heaven, bringing him this chalice of bitterness that our Lord had to drink, right? His passion. And our Lord in Matthew 26, 39, we see that it says, he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So here's all about our Lord. You know, all his life was all about doing the Father's will. And, but not as I will, not from his human will, not what he wanted, but what our Heavenly Father wanted. And this is what the divine will is all, all about, right? The divine will of the Father. Not as I will, but as you will, Father in heaven. Right? So this is the fear of our Lord. We had the fear of our lady. Now the fear of our Lord right here. Also on the cross, this is the beginning of the whole passion. So then he goes on the cross. And uh, from the second hour of agony in the garden of Gethsemane, from the hour of the passion, we read this, right? This same exact passage from the Bible, Matthew. And Jesus says, wanting to give life to all and making a solemn reparation to the Father in heaven for the rebellions of creatures. As many as three times, he repeated. Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me, that souls withdrawing from our will become lost. This chalice is very bitter for me. However, not my will, but yours be done. This is the revelation that our Lord gives Luisa. So he's telling us this chalice that uh, is causing him so much, so much pain and bitterness is the fact that souls no, withdraw from the divine will. And this is what happened with Adam. Adam did his own human will. He became the CR by doing his own human will, right? He lost the divine will. You know, he withdrew from that gift that he had at the very beginning. You know, the gift of living in the divine will. And now our Lord, uh, through this passion of his, you know, is there to uh, provide, to do the solemn reparation that he did dying on the cross for all of humanity, for our salvation, right? So from uh, 1 Peter 2, we, we read, He himself bore our sins. In his body on the cross, 
so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Notice here, it says, by his wounds, you have been healed. We have been healed from that state, you know, from that state of CR, right? Uh, into, um, you know, now going into the book of heaven from volume 14, February 26, 1922. Jesus says, my redemption, ransom, notice he's using the word ransom, the creature from sin. My humanity acted just like a tender mother with her newborn. Since he can take no other food, the baby did not take any other food. In order to give life to her baby, she opens up her breast and attaches her baby to it. And from her own blood, converted into milk, she administers to him the nourishment to give him life. More than mother, my humanity, let many holes be opened in itself by the blows of lash, almost like many breasts which sent out rivers of blood so that my children, by attaching themselves to them, might suckle the nourishment to receive life and develop their growth. So here, our Lord is through his body and blood. He gives us his, he gives us life, right? Through the sacraments, through the Holy Eucharist, he gives us his body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ to, for us to receive his life, to develop our growth. So it is through his wounds, through his through his, um, through his death on the cross, right? We see also from the, from the same chapter, it says, and my wounds, and with my wounds, I covered their deformities, rendering them more beautiful than before. And if in creating man, in creating them, I made them like clearest and noble heavens. In redemption, I adorned them studying them with the most refulgent stars of my wounds, thus to cover their ugliness and render them more beautiful. To their wounds and deformities, I attach the diamonds, the pearls, the gems of my pains in order to hide all their evils and clothe them with such magnificence as to surpass the state of origin. So here's a great key, right? After the fall, we see that Cain killed Abel, right? Now then, nowadays, we still see like the Russians are killing the Ukrainians on a daily basis. So we haven't gone too far, right? Even though with the death of our Lord, with his wounds, he's covering our deformities. With his, um, um, he's rent, trying to render us more beautiful than before, right? When on creation, he created us as clear and noble heaven. Now he's adorning us with his refulgent stars, with his wounds, with his with his blood, you know, to cover this ugliness. So the whole goal of creation and the whole goal of redemption is to return man to the state of origin. So are we there yet? Like if we were to look at the chart again, are we there yet? Are we surpassing the state of the or of our origin? No, not yet, right? That's unfortunate. And we have to pass through some more before we get to the fullness of redemption to, the, to surpass our state of origin. So what does uh, our Lord teach us to pray? He taught us to pray the Our Father. He says, in this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we get that from our Lord's prayer from Matthew 6, 9 to 10. So, if you look at our Lord's Prayer, Lord's Prayer is saying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? So think about a, mi a minute, like in heaven, what is the, the saints that are living in heaven? What will are they doing? They're doing the divine will. They're doing the will of God, right? Even the souls in purgatory. When we die, the, you know, if we go to purgatory, you don't have your will anymore. You leave your body and your will, your human will. You leave it. When you, when you check in, right? So even the, you know, any blink, the blinking of an eye in purgatory is the divine will. It has to be the will of God blinking in you. No, no longer do we have that freedom that we have right here to choose. Now, so we lose that, right? But 
But our Lord is saying here that his will, his divine will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So how is that going to happen, right? As long as there's two wills, as long as there's a human will and you have your choice and you want to do your own will. You know, how can you do the divine will here on earth? How can you do this? Fiat voluntas tua sicut in cello et in terra, which is what we pray in Latin. No, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we do it here on earth? So something has to change, right? Something has to, you know, radically change, you know, so that we can, uh, that kingdom of the divine will on earth uh, as it is in heaven can be established. So from the book of heaven, from volume 23, February the 5th, 1928. Our Lord says, Now as I came from heaven and formed the kingdom of redemption, before departing her for heaven, before his ascension, I made another promise more solemn of the kingdom of my divine will. And that was in the Our Father. And so as to give it more value and obtain it more quickly, I made this formal promise in the solemnity of my prayer, praying the Father, to let his kingdom come, which is the kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. This is the seventh day of creation, right? The day of rest. The kingdom of the divine will in its fullness on earth here as it is in for the saints in heaven. And this is a promise that, you know, so our Lord, you know, made this formal promise. So if our Lord says, makes a promise, it's going to happen for sure. He went and said to as well. I said, let it come. Let the divine will, or the kingdom of the divine will come. Let it come, right? This meant that it must come and creatures must await it with that certainty with which they awaited the future redeemer. Because there is my divine will bound and committed. In those words of the Our Father, when it binds itself, whatever promises is more than certain. More so since everything was prepared by me Nothing else was needed but the manifestation of my kingdom. And this I am doing. Right? Our Lord said, this let it come means it's going to come. You know, so our Lord, if you think about it, our Lord died. It's going to be 2,000 years since he died on the cross. Right? 2023 to 2033. We got 10 more years to go before it's, you know, a full 2,000 years. And uh, our Lord is saying that this kingdom, you know, that he's going to establish right here with the manifestation of his kingdom is, is what's going to uh, bring us this next era, right? And from John 3, 12, you know, we see here that our Lord said he didn't give it to us back in that day. Says, if I had told you earthly things and you did not, be you did not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So this fiat voluntas tua, all these knowledges of the kingdom, where are they? Well, you know, from the period of time from 1899 to 1938, our Lord gave Luisa the book of heaven, right? Let's see. It says, by obedience to her confessor, Luisa wrote 36, 36 notebooks over a period of 40 years, known as her diary, the book of heaven which she wrote down everything Jesus told her, especially as it relates to the kingdom of the divine will. Imagine, you know, our Lord took her for 40 years, a first grade student, to write, you know, there's about 3,600 entries in the book of heaven that talks about this kingdom of the divine will. 40 years of writing is the only place you'll find you know, the Lord's message about his, the Lord's gospel about his kingdom of the divine will. You know, from the previous uh, slide, we saw that his manifestations were missing. You could say, you know, and we'll see that in the chart, that from this manifestations, our Lord is saying like, now I'm ready to start the kingdom of the divine will here on earth as it is in heaven. And our Lord says from volume 20, December 8, 1926, he says, this is why I have so much interest that you write, Luisa, because of the great good I want to do to the human family 
so much so that I look upon them as, as my own writings. Because it is, it is always I, the one who dictates, and you are the little secretary of the long story of my will. The Lord, Lord is saying this, these are his writings, right? So we have uh, today, I brought, you know, these are the writings of the Book of Heaven. The 36 volumes of the Book of Heaven are right here. There's a tiny little print, so I have uh, some uh, magnifying glasses to go with it. But, you know, we have 36 notebooks, you know, that come in different fashions like this one that Anne-Marie is holding up that are available, very nice to read, you know, and they contain all the writings, what our Lord is saying. I look upon them as my own writing. These are our Lord's writings. This is not Luisa's writing. Luisa didn't want to write anything. She had to write it out of, you know, out of obedience. She called her Lady Obedience is making me do this. Because otherwise she would not do anything. No, she, she had a, uh, he, she just barely knew how to read and write. Uh, first grade education, right? You know how to read and write, and that's pretty much it. So this is, you know, from the study of many theologians, you know, we can safely say that he's going to be a doctor of the church one day. You know, these writings are doctoral dissertations that are just unbelievable. They're just beautiful. And uh, we encourage you to, to, to learn uh, about, you know, to read the Book of Heaven for sure. Luisa is the little secretary. So it's not the work of uh, Luisa, the work of God. And then he says on volume 20, December 8, 1926, my daughter, these writings of ours come from the depth of my heart. And in them, I make flow the tenderness of my heart to touch those who will read them and the firmness of my divine speech to strengthen them in the truths of my will. In all the sayings, truths, examples, which I make you write on paper, I make flow the dignity of my celestial wisdom in such a way that those who read them or will read them, if they are in grace, and that's the key, right? If they are in grace, they will feel within themselves my tenderness, the firmness of my speech, and the light of my wisdom. And as though in between magnets, they will be drawn into the knowledge of my will. Our Lord says, you know, this, this gift of living in the divine world, that gift he has for his creatures, you know, it's the, the basis of it in order to receive it is the knowledge. You know, so we all need to write, to read and write, uh, to read. We all need to read the, uh, the book of heaven to, to gain this knowledge. And this takes us, my friends, to the timeline of the work of God in sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit. We look at the timeline, right? We go from the center, the fullness of time that starts with Jesus and Mary, 2,000 years over, well, at the end, to the end of time, where Christ the King begins his reign of the kingdom of the divine world on earth as it is in heaven. And this is exactly where we find ourselves. We find ourselves somewhere in that blue box that says the end of time. That's um, the work of sanctification. We'll make copies. See, when, once we go through this talk, you know, I'll make this slides available. And this, okay, so this chart is not my own doing. This is the work of Father Pablo Martin that he's known the divine world for 50 years. And this is what he's is bringing to us through the book uh, called The Splendor of Creation. El Esplendor de la Creación is in Spanish. So uh, this is his chart. And according to this, the, the, um, this millennium, the half an era, which spans a thousand years, starts with the, uh, with the writings of Luisa Picarreta. You know, that's when the manifestations of the kingdom came to be. You know, we need to have the knowledge of the divine will in order to enter into the kingdom, right? So the end of time is not just one or two years. We don't know the date or the time. We don't know how long it's going to be. That the block of blue is just to give us an idea. We're at the very beginning of this kingdom of the uh, of the work of the Holy Spirit of sanctification. Let's go through this. We can answer questions at the end. Okay? And so we enter the, the era of sanctification of God, the Holy Spirit, with the fiat voluntas tua, secut in cello et in terra, in, uh, in English, it will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Okay? So these are the exciting times that we're living in. So from Luisa Picaretta from volume 12, February 22nd, 1921, Jesus said, the generations will not end until my will reigns on earth. My redeeming fiat will place itself in the middle between the creating fiat and the sanctifying fiat. They will intertwine all three together and will accomplish the sanctification of man. The third fiat, the fiat of the Holy Spirit, will give such grace to the creature as to make a return almost to the state of origin. And then, once I have seen man, just as he came out of me, my work will be complete. And I will take my perpetual rest in the last fiat. Only the life of my volition will give back to man the state of origin. Only the life of the divine will will give back to the man the state of origin. Therefore, be attentive and together with me, Luisa, help me to complete the sanctification of the creature. So Luisa was writing all this. This is how Luisa is known as the little secretary of the divine will. So she's like writing everything that our Lord is dictating to her, right? So what is our Lord saying here, right? That he's going to accomplish the sanctification of man, the return almost to the state of, of origin that we lost in paradise. It's my redeeming fiat will place itself in the middle between creation and sanctification, right? So creation, redemption, sanctification, that forms the chart right there. They will intertwine all three together to accomplish that sanctification of man. So that complete the fullness of the sanctification of man doesn't happen until the fullness of the kingdom of the divine will here on earth, right? That's why we're starting. He, he says we, we know many signs, right? The fact that we have wars and rumors of wars. All these signs that we've been told in Revelation and all throughout, you know, everything that's happening right now. This is all the, uh, the making, you know, the arrival into this new era of sanctification of man. We'll see some of that in a bit. So this is all about the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the creature. And then from volume 19, June 15, 1926. Our Lord says, this is the, the, the reading we're going to cover this, this last week, right? Says, my daughter, the triumph of my will is connected with creation and redemption. It can be called one single triumph. Since a woman was the cause of the ruin of man, Eve, it was a virgin woman that after 4,000 years, letting my humanity united to the eternal word be born of her, Our Lady, right? Our Lady and our Lord Jesus provided the remedy for the ruin of fallen man. Redemption provides a remedy for the ruin of fallen man. Now that the remedy for man is formed, is my will alone to be left without its full completion while it has its prime act both in creation and redemption. Our Lord it says, the divine will is both in creation and redemption. You know, the triumph of the divine will you know, spans creation, redemption, and sanctification now, right? Until man returns to the origin, state of origin, you know, God's not going to be able to rest, right? Okay, so we hit the, the hour, the 15 hour of the day. We're going to take a break here to do the chaplet of mercy. After the chaplet, we'll continue here. Mm -hmm. 